Hey everyone, welcome to another AP Environmental Science Lecture. Today we're going to look at two things in regards to evolution. We're going to start off with speciation, and then we're going to move on to the pace of evolution. So, in regards to speciation, we know over time speciation has given rise to millions of species that are on Earth today. And beyond determining how many exist, and what environmental scientists are really interested in is understanding how quickly existing species can change um, and how quickly new species evolve and how quickly even species can go extinct. So we're going to start off examining the processes that produce new species and the factors that determine how rapidly these species can evolve in response to changes in the environment. And then we're going to close out the lecture um, looking at how evolution alters the traits that species express and because different traits perform well in some environments not in others. We're going to look at how the evolution of species affects where species are able to live on Earth. And especially as environments are changing and have changed over the millions of years, we look at how species are altering their distributions, how we are finding certain species in different areas on Earth and why we don't find them in other areas. So this response also should suggest that environmental changes in the future are going to continue to affect, affect distribution of species. So we're going to close off the chapter looking at how global climate change is affecting these species, whether they're going to exist and be able to adapt or become extinct. So looking at the evolution of new species, allopatric, um, allos is Greek for other, and patric means fatherland. So this just occurs where you have geographic isolation. Perfect example could be the uh, pork fish where it wasn't until about three and a half million years ago where North America and South America were finally bridged together by this isthmus, the isthmus of Panama. Prior to three and a half million years ago, organisms would have been able to go back and forth between the Pacific Ocean, Caribbean Sea, and Atlantic. But again, three and a half million years ago, you have this isthmus uh, volcanically, geologically created, cutting off these species of pork fish. And as a result, we see this evolution of two new species. And this could be a mountain range, this could be a river, whatever geographically is separating um, two uh, species and allow it to evolve. Another way this can happen is through reproductive isolation. So you have the same species, they evolve separately, and a perfect example is this Darwin's finch in the Galapagos. You can see how specialized they are uh, depending on their beak and what their food source is. So over time, these finches evolved, and not only did their beaks change, but so did their courtship, even their breeding seasons. So we can trace all these finches back to one common ancestor. But now today, for example, the medium tree finch would not be able to um, produce with the medium ground finch. They've evolved that much differently, producing um, new finches. And again, another example, you have the salamanders in California. They're separated by mountain ranges. They're separated by um, different vegetation. So as a result, we have, again, we can trace these salamanders back to one common ancestor, but now we have, they would not even uh, breed, be able to interbreed together. Sympatric speciation, so there is no geographic isolation. And what happens here is mostly polyploidy. Uh, majority of organisms are diploids. Example is you have 46 chromosomes. If you divide that by two, you got 23 from mom, 23 from dad. A lot of this has been done um, by humans deliberately. Uh, your fruits like strawberries, bananas, even wheat in this case is polyploidy. And you can see a polyploid organism produces, in this case, more grain. So it can occur again by humans, but we can also just see it happen naturally. Um, quickly reviewing the two types of speciation we talked about. Allopatric, here we have a separation between the two species, so they evolve separately, eventually not being able to interbreed with each other. Here you don't have a geographic isolation, it just occurs naturally. Now that we know how we get certain species, now we're going to look at how the pace of evolution, how fast or how slow does this occur. And, You've been told in your past biology classes is a very slow process, but there are instances which we will see here in a bit of how this can also happen within a lifetime. Rapid evolution where 
these organisms can survive and environmental change and can quickly adapt to these new conditions. And what we see is we see this in the cichlid populations in uh, Lake Tanganyika in Eastern Africa. What we have today is 200 different distinct colorful cichlid species that took about several million years to occur. And what started to happen is now they're more specialized. So we have cichlids in this lake that feed only on insects. Some will feed only on fish and others you have feeding on invertebrates like snails or clams. So this is an example of a quick adaptation in one location. Somewhere closer to home, um, if you go to Death Valley in Nevada, California, well, we have our pupfishes. And the desert pupfish is a related to um, fish that existed quite a while ago when Death Valley wasn't the desert we see today. About 20 to 30,000 years ago, there used to be large lakes in the region. So you can imagine large lakes having many different types of fish. But then as the climate's changed, we a lot of those fish have disappeared or become extinct or in danger. But now we see these isolated groups of pupfish that have evolved in these tiny springs in the region and they're allowed to survive. So another example of rapid evolution. Believe it or not, there can be even something faster than rapid evolution. That's our you can be things can evolve very rapidly. Um, one example is through genetically modified organisms. So in especially corn and cotton, there's a bacteria that's found in soil that does a very, very good job of uh, keeping away insecticides or insects. I'm sorry. So what it's called the BT gene. And what they'll do is they'll insert it to the genes of corn or cotton. And instead of the um, corn be infected by the European corn borer, which will eat it and decimate the crop. Now, in organisms that's used to eating this, uh, because that gene is inserted into the crop, that organism will die. Another example of very rapid evolution is due to human overfishing. In the 1930s, you can look up at the top where Atlantic cod, so if you've ever had fish and chips, this is the fish you're eating. In the 30s, um, these organisms, the ones they were pulling out of the ocean, they were about nine years old. They were much heavier, much longer. And if you look at the ones we're pulling out now, it only takes seven years for them to become sexually mature and they're much smaller fish. This is a perfect example of very rapid evolution taking place because you have to imagine the fishermen are looking for the biggest fish. And as a result, in the 1930s, these big fish were taken and eaten. So the only fish that were reproducing were the smaller ones. And we can see this happening right before our eyes. So now if you go out to catch these fish, they're much smaller and more sexually mature at seven years, whereas in the past it was up to nine years. We're going to close out here looking at how evolution of niches and species are going to determine where species are distributed around the planet Earth. And all living things have this range of tolerance. So, and what we mean by range of tolerance, these are abiotic factors. And what we mean by abiotic factors, this could be temperature, humidity, salinity, pH, anything like that. But there's a certain range where an organism is going to be able to not only survive and grow, but this optimum range is where they're going to be able to reproduce. There could be a stress range where this organism can um, survive and grow, but reproduction is not going to take place. So there's two types of niches. First one we're going to look at is that fundamental niche. So think something fundamental is what that organism needs to grow, survive, and reproduce. And looking at the uh, figure on the right here, you have these muscles. And in regards to the fundamental niche, this is all, they are located in an area where they're receiving that um, the high and low tides, so they're remaining near or above the water line. They're able to grow here and they're able to reproduce. And these are all abiotic limits. But these are fundamental. And it's important to point out that this is not how it occurs in nature. So what we need to look at is the realized niche. And what the realized niche is looking at is not only the abiotic factors that we just looked at, but it's also looking at biotic factors as well. So, you know, these biotic factors are further going to limit locations where species can live. So biotic factors would be competitors. 
we can see here there's two types of muscles and now we have another group growing within that between that high and low tide so now they're competing for space you can even have predators that come and feed on these muscles or even you'll have uh, disease that might go through the area so in this experiment here they had um, added some either these at the top these darker color ones were the competitors and we can see how they out competed not only space and then the the lighter color the blue colored balanus muscles are now removed from the area so this realized niche is what we look at not only the abiotic factors but the biotic factors as well So that realized niche, what we can do is we can take that and we can see the distribution of species. We know what it takes. We know the fundamental. We know the abiotic um, necessities that an organism needs. And then we include the biotic competition, things of like that, and we get our distribution. So here you can see, for example, on the right is just the amount of mammals in a certain area, the distribution of mammals in North America. And again, that takes into account that um, – ability to grow and compete and it's just looking at that range of tolerance and there's different types of niches you can have a generalist so a generalist is like your raccoon your raccoon can essentially live anywhere it has a wide range of abiotic and biotic conditions it can withstand it will eat almost anything you'll find it in your garbage but it also eats you know berries and nuts and seeds and things of that nature so we call this an animal like a raccoon a generalist and it, going back to your, uh, your lab, the generalist in regards to the, um, the bean lab was those were the birds that would, are not picky. They, they could have eaten any bean. Whereas a specialist in regards to our panda here, they have to live in a specific habitat. They usually rely on one source of food. Um, and a panda is a perfect example. Panda specifically needs bamboo. And we call those types of animals a specialist. And by looking at it, you can see that the number of individuals, there's very little leeway compared to that raccoon where these guys can live almost anywhere. And we see that happening with the panda now where there's uh, undergoing habitat loss. So now you have less bamboo forests in China. The bamboo forests can only live at a certain elevation. So as a result, we have this very sensitive species, the niche specialist, which in this case is the panda, is now... Uh, populations are declining where we don't really we'll see a uh, raccoon succeed in many different types of ecosystems so why is this important it's important because one we know the environment is changing we know what limits or what is needed for a species to survive and as a result we can we know that environmental change is going to determine where species are distributed so a perfect example is we can see the three types of trees here, you have pine, spruce, and birch going back 18,000 years to the last ice age. What scientists did is they recovered pollen from lake sediments, and what that pollen told them is what plant species were moving as the temperatures warmed following the retreat of the glaciers about 12,000 years ago. So you can see that the areas shown in color or white were sampled for pollen, whereas areas shown in gray were not sampled. But we can see there is a direct correlation is as the ice sheets retreated north, so did the different types of trees. So that environmental change, though, not only in the case of the trees we just saw allowed them to advance, but it will also, environmental change will also result in species becoming extinct. And we can look here as that as global temperatures change, um, this gives you an idea of the predicted extinction re, uh, risk. So you can see South America is the highest risk for amount of species going extinct. This probably has a lot to do with habitat loss, our Amazon rainforest here as well. But you can see there's no place on earth that is left untouched to this um, extinction. So important to note, that environmental change and species extinction, there has been many mass extinctions in the 4.6 billion years Earth has been around. And the greatest, the, the most important thing to point out is that 99% of species that ever existed that have ever lived on Earth are extinct. So it's this natural process. 
And species given Earth's past have only been around 1 to 10 million years. They go extinct, and we all know that new life uh, evolves as a result, or some species do much better when these mass extinctions occur. So looking at quickly at the mass extinctions, the five major mass extinctions that occurred in Earth's past, the greatest mass extinction took place about 250 million years ago where we had roughly 90% of all life on earth go extinct and we still aren't really sure the main cause of this extinction and it's important to point out there's not usually one main cause that causes an extinction there's something that triggers it but then you have this trickle effect where you have all these you know you have increased temperatures resulting in decreased uh, or increased water temperatures and so on so it's this trickle effect and then 65 million years ago that's the one we're all familiar with that's when we lost about half of the earth species including the dinosaurs due to the, uh, the meteorite, the large meteorite that struck Earth, producing this cloud of dust that circled the planet, and essentially it blocked incoming solar radiation and ceased photosynthesis for a while. So you can see it's this not one direct cause, but it's a many different effects. So many scientists are viewing extinctions as the ultimate result of the change environment. So every time we see one of these mass extinctions, we can see in Earth's past that there was a huge environmental change. And what the goal of this class or environmental science is to apply the lessons learned to help. Now we're going to predict the effects of environmental changes that are taking place on Earth today. So one thing we can look at is based on our knowledge of niche requirements, we can see that as climate is changing, in this case you have the Loblolly Pine, your current dis distribution, it's usually found in the southeast, but due to global climate change, temperatures are warming, we're actually seeing that in 2100 there's going to be more abundant pines moving into the Midwest, the Northeast, due to that climate change. And we're going to close out the lecture with kind of a bummer, is we know for a fact we are currently in our sixth mass extinction, but what really kind of makes it stink is that this one is the current mass extinction has human causes. So there's a wide range of causes that include habitat destruction, overharvesting, introduction of invasive species, climate change, diseases, and it's estimated now that extinction rates very widely ranging from 2% to as many as 25% of species are going, going to be extinct by 2020. So that is where we're going to end it just because it's so important, especially in this class and especially for you guys moving forward as citizens of this earth. You know, how are we going to allow this biodiversity to recover? You know, the last extinction, it took 10 million years for life to bounce back and you know, we're kind of on this fence right now on what we can do. So that's going to do it for this. Hope I didn't bum me out too much. Know that you can be a hummingbird and maybe stop this six max extinction from happening. Who knows? We'll see. If you have any questions, as always, email me or come see me in class.